Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Terry, and uh, thank you all for coming to think with me a little bit about peyote and its problems. Um, I, I'm advertising that I'll be talking about the cultivation of peyote, but really the cultivation is a sort of a proposed solution to a problem, and I'd rather think first about, let's define the problem. Um, and the problem, actually, to put it in one word or two, is uh, uh, over-harvesting. Uh, let me introduce you to peyote. Uh, this, is, this is the way that this cactus grows in uh, the tunnel leaf and thorn scrub of South Texas. Uh, the, the largest one there, uh, that, that one, say, uh, is probably eight centimeters in diameter and maybe clears the ground in this lush weather they're having there. It may be an inch or so tall. This is the way the same species looks in the Chihuahuan desert portion of its range, which is sort of uh, north central Mexico and uh, western Texas. Oh, notice the, the uh, limestone. Uh, where you don't have wall-to-wall -wall peyote, you have wall-to-wall -wall limestone. It, it very much likes, uh, prefers a, a calcareous soil, if not frank uh, limestone chunks. <laughs> This is basically the geographic distribution of this plant, and this is a complicated uh, slide because it's, it's trying to deal with several species and subspecies. But uh, if you just just look at the 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 gray and the green uh, and the yellow, uh, that that basically tells you where Lophophora williamsii, which is the thing that we normally associate with the, the concept of peyote, that's where it lives. It, it's it's primarily a Mexican distribution, just creeps across the border. Uh, in the tunnel even thorn scrub zone of, of South Texas and sort of hugs the river until it gets around to the, the Big Bend area of uh, the Chihuahuan Desert part of Texas. Um, the Native American church is one of the stakeholders here uh, in this uh, over-harvesting problem because they depend on uh, a substantial supply of peyote for use in their religious ceremonies, which is, a, uh, which is protected by law. Uh, this is the place of business of a peyote dealer. He's a, he's a licensed peyote distributor. He pays a fee every year to the Texas Department of Public Safety who basically stand in as a, a, a local um, agent of the Drug Enforcement Administration in Texas, which is the only state where peyote occurs naturally. Um, he sends his, his workers out into the field. They gather um, sacks full of peyote, bring them back to him. Um, he counts them. Uh, sorts them and sells them to uh, members of the Native American church. This is one of his grinding bins. The, and here you see uh, uh, a few hundred peyote, probably close to a thousand. Um, each one of these uh, <coughs> globular things is actually the aerial portion of the plant. In other words, if, if you cut it off right at ground level, then you get these things here. And some of them, you'll, you'll note, have been cut a little too deep. And uh, that, um, that, that turns out to be a bit of a problem. But, but these, uh, the, the largest specimens you're seeing in this bin here, 50 years ago, would have been the smallest specimens. And that's, that's a key point. But one of the clinical signs of um, uh, over-harvesting, and this, this is not just true of peyote, uh, one of the clinical signs of over-harvesting is small size, a decrease in the average size of plants that are available to harvest. Um, this is a plant that, that has been sort of almost dug out of the ground to show you some anatomy. Um, this, uh, this green soft part with the little tufts of hairs, they, they have no spines, it's a cactus, but it just has little, little hairs instead of spines. It's quite easy to handle. Um, and uh, so, so th this particular plant here has has two uh, crowns. We would we would call that that above ground part, that aerial photosynthetic part of the plant. And and if you were harvesting this plant for for use, uh, you know, in a religious ceremony, you would cut it right there at ground level and remove that photosynthetic top, uh, which then would be called a button in the trade. Um, well. 
to, a, a lot of people sort of intuitively assume that below ground level, if you cut off if you cut off the photosynthetic part there, then everything below that is going to be root. Um, that is not so for this plant. As a matter of fact, the root doesn't start until somewhere down in this area. You can see you can see these lateral roots and where they come from. You notice there's no roots coming out up above, and all this part of the plant here is actually subterranean stem. That becomes a critical uh, fact when you're thinking of regeneration of this plant because the way it regenerates, if you cut the top off, you remove the apical meristem, right? So you're also removing that source of branching suppressant hormone and therefore you can, you can get regeneration by um, lateral branches emerging from this subterranean portion of the stem. If you're lazy or if you, or you just don't care and you take a shovel and you sort of cut this plant off down here somewhere, then you're removing its capability to regenerate um, new stem tissue and, and therefore that plant will die. Uh, this happens. Uh, this is sort of the economics of peyote. Uh, as, it's, uh, as it's harvested in the regulatory uh, manner, let's say, uh, th this is the regulated trade that, that is kept track of by the Texas Department of Public Safety. And, and so, so here you have, you know, along the x-axis you have uh, years, and each year has its own little data point, and uh, this, this black curve here uh, really uh, refers to over here, buttons sold in millions. So this, this 2011 data point right here, and you know, you're talking about uh, something like uh, one, and, one and a half million uh, buttons or so were sold in that calendar year. Um, the, the red curve here, uh, again, showing annual data uh, and, and referring to the, the right-hand y-axis over here, uh, is the number of dollars in thousands um, that, that uh, are received for this number of buttons. So, so here you've got, you know, close to half a million dollars. Uh, here you've got, uh, what, one and a half million uh, buttons. That comes out to something like uh, 30, 35 cents a piece, uh, which is ridiculously cheap, which is part of the problem of over-harvesting. <coughs> Um, so, okay, yeah, uh, just for those of you who want to be botanists, uh, the, the real name of the plant is Lophophora williams the eye, uh, but it goes by peyote commonly. Um, the overharvesting is a problem for two different groups, quite different groups. One of them is the Native American church, which of course, uh, it, the, the problem for them, they feel the problem as a decreased availability of sacrament for use in their religious ceremonies. Um, the, the conservationist group, uh, feels the problem as uh, a decimation and loss of wild populations of this plant, which is not a keystone species by any means, but it is uh, an aesthetically pleasing um, and uh, beautiful member of the of the Tumwe uh, Thonskra and Chihuahua Desert. Um, so, okay, how do we solve the problem of over-harvesting? Over one, one thing that has been um, repeatedly suggested and then found to fail over the past 30 years or so is, well, okay, we've got a shortage of peyote on the north side of the Rio Grande. Why don't we just go to Mexico and import peyote where it's so abundant that it'll never be noticed? Well, um, the Mexican legislation is not suited for that to happen, and uh, if anybody who can read the law, Norma Cero Cincuenta Nueve, will see that. Um, to, to, to actually export peyote from Mexico to the U.S. would be ignoring the existence of Mexican indigenous peoples like the Huicholis, like the Tepehuanes, like the Cora, like the Tarahumara. All these groups also depend on peyote and they're depending on Mexican peyote. So the Mexican government would be, um, well, it would, it would be a political non-starter to suggest taking the peyote from the Mexican indigenous groups and giving it to the um, United States uh, indigenous groups. Um, the, the, the last nail in this coffin is that uh, the peyote is in fact being badly overharvested in Mexico now. Maybe 30 years ago you could have made the argument that peyote was abundant in Mexico. No more. Um, this is the scene of recent poaching in Mexico in sort of East Central San Luis Potosí in the summer of 2011, and uh, 
this hole right here uh, is a place where peyote grew just a few weeks before. Uh, there were hundreds of these holes over uh, an area of maybe half a hectare um, when I visited this locality. Um, the, these plants right here are just some that my students picked up on the trail out from this, this population. Uh, they, their bags, the bags of the poachers were obviously so full they were dropping them inadvertently. But uh, this is the kind of devastation that is occurring uh, all over Mexico now. Um, so to cut to the chase, what's the real solution to the problem of overharvesting? Well, I, I propose that it's cultivation. And you can go either two ways in, in cultivation. You can, you can talk about cultivation in habitat, which some people like to call wild grafting. Um, the problem with that in, in the habitat, certainly on the US side of the border, is that um, it requires huge amounts of real estate, huge acreages. And the reason is, again, it's the poachers that we're concerned about. You have to have a, a large area of land in order to have adequate distance between the peyote population in the middle and the nearest road out here to make it not worthwhile for the poachers to do the walk through the, the thorn scrub, the harvesting, carrying the, the, the heavy sack back to the road. As long as that distance is great enough, they're only in it for the beer money. Uh, so so they're, they're not going to overexert themselves. They want easily access peyote. So the, the, you know, the, the rich man's uh, solution to that is, yeah, you just buy you know, um, two or 3,000 hectares and you got it made. Uh, put the peyote in the middle. Um, cultivation in a greenhouse. It has uh, doesn't oh oh and full-time personnel don't forget about that you get the, if the people who protect peyote populations and actually there are some healthy ones are those who have patrols around the borders of their ranch with their 10-foot fences and uh, yeah uh, peyote can can be nur nurtured and uh, and do well and cultivation in the greenhouse doesn't require nearly as much outlay of capital. It, sure, you have to purchase a greenhouse, and uh, and you, there's some technical training that is is advisable, uh, so as not to waste um, seed and, and young plants. But uh, peyote is one of the easiest cacti in the world to grow, so that's not really a, a big hurdle. Um, the the good thing is that uh, you can put up a greenhouse anywhere. Uh, this this you know greenhouse cultivation of peyote can be done virtually uh, anywhere that there is a local. Uh, Native American church to take care of the plants. Uh, so, so I, I would suggest that yeah, this is a win-win-win situation. This cultivation, uh, by doing so, the Native American church members assume local control of their local production for consumption in their local church. It's all neatly packaged and uh, is therefore not very susceptible to. Uh, diversion, as the DEA would put it, um, it it's, it's, uh, it, they, they can they can protect as well as nurture uh, the peyote, grow, peyote grown in a greenhouse. Um, one of one of the problems it will also solve is that you know when somebody drives a couple of thousand miles down from Washington State or from New Hampshire uh, to to buy their their Native American church peyote, uh, oftentimes now they'll get there thinking that there's something to buy. And they're told, oh, no, sorry, no peyote this week, come back next week or two weeks from now. Uh, that sort of um, uncertainty would, would be, um, would, would not obtain if you had uh, each NAC church uh, uh, doing its own cultivation in its own greenhouse. Um, now, this last point is the, the most um, tentative one. Um, <coughs> I, I would like to, to think that the widespread adoption of cultivation by the Native American church would in fact relieve harvesting pressure from the wild populations and therefore uh, you know, allow them to recover and, and be restored in, in situ certain situations. Um, I can't promise that that would be the case. All I can say is it certainly could do no harm if, if the Native American church were relying on supplies that they grew in their own greenhouses. It couldn't do any harm to the native population. It might do some good. Um, uh, we, we've had um, people, at, particularly elders of the church, ask us, uh, well, is this cultivation stuff, uh, you know, is the peyote that we get from that natural? And 
Uh, my, my answer to that is to, to take a look at uh, prehistoric gardens, which actually still persist to this day. And uh, I, I would go on the assumption that that was a natural act to transport that peyote from wherever it came from to a human site of habitation or a human spiritual site. And, and in fact, uh, this is one such site. Uh, that, that is an old peyote button. Uh, that's, that's probably uh, oh, something like 10 centimeters in diameter. Um, maybe, you know, it could easily be 100 years old, that individual. Um, it's it's uh, growing right at the side of this purplish rock here. Now, that kind of rock is igneous. Oh, thank you. Um, three minutes? This time's up. It's time's up. Okay. Um, the, the soil here is also igneous. This plant was, there, there, there are maybe a dozen plants here, uh, all old, all untouched. Nobody's seen them or you know, thought about them for a long, long time. The peyote normally grows in calcareous soil, in limestone soil. The fact that this plant is here means that somebody brought this plant or its ancestors here a long time ago. Um, that, that's one of the pictographs on another igneous rock a few meters away. Uh, this is fast forwarding to Mexico, 1929. Uh, this guy is uh, managing to cultivate peyote quite nicely. Um, in the present, uh, this is Czech Republic, 2009. This is one individual with a cheap greenhouse, uh, you know, wood and plastic, and uh, growing a very nice uh, collection of Lofopera. This is a graphic which I don't want to get into unless you ask me enforce me to. But uh, these obviously don't look like natural peyotes. I would not, I would not suggest that anyone use these kinds of peyote for, for ceremony. These are strictly to accelerate the production of seed in huge quantities. You, you basically take a, a peyote plant and you graft a single tiny seedling onto one of these Peresciopsis, it's, it's an opuntioid uh, cactus genus. And uh, the, the, um, the amount of energy that goes into the cyan, the peyote, uh, just causes it to basically explode before your very eyes. Um, and uh, it produces lots and lots of flowers and lots and lots of uh, uh, seeds. So this is a way to get started on seed, which can be a barrier to somebody who wants to just start out to do uh, Cultivation. It can be done by anybody. This is grafting. This was done by a student at Solros. This is in our greenhouse. Um, the future of cultivation is the biggie. Um, that's the big question, the unknown. And, and the uncertainties are all in the political and uh, regulatory realm. Um, the Native American church is assured by the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that uh, they will be able to propagate peyote, they will be able to cultivate peyote. What's not spelled out in the legislation is how. And that requires regulations. And regulations have to be promulgated by some government agency. In this case, it would be the Drug Enforcement Administration, whose primary responsibility is to enforce the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. Um, you got to get these two people at the same table. And the only way that's going to happen is for the Native American church to sit down and write a petition to the Drug Enforcement Administration saying, look, we need to be able to cultivate peyote. Our supplies are, are being decimated. And uh, please, please give us some regulations that will protect us and allow us to, to have our church ceremonies. Um, but the NSC, up to this moment, has not yet got the courage to do that. They, they have not been able to muster the, whatever it takes to, to submit uh, the petition to the, to the regulatory agency. Uh, well, as they keep on going in the, in the populations, uh, continue to decline, then guess who else will get into the act? It'll be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, triggered by the, the Endangered Species Act. That will be an interesting three-ring circus. Um, if, if the Native American church ever gets really disgusted, they can always sue the government. And that will go immediately to the Supreme Court. The Roberts Court has a very good record for uh, protecting religious freedom of indigenous groups. Uh, witness the ayahuasca decision in 2006. And finally, if all else fails, the NAC can go straight to Congress and get the law changed. And uh, they have, again, they have a very good record. The church has a good record with uh, convincing the Congress to do what's right by religious freedom. Thank you for your patience.